just going to wait for another two, three minutes just to um, let anyone who might, who might have planned to, to yeah, join us now, um, give them time and then we'll get started. We will record the presentations. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know, Yes, yesterday and the day before, uh, I mean, we haven't uh, posted the recordings for yesterday and the day before, but we will do so um, very soon. It will we be done. Write, it will be, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe on um, the Université uh, de Lorraine channel before the ECB channel, if we want to do it to be done soon. But we, we will post it on our website. Yeah, we'll put the link on there. If, yeah. if you've seen our website. Um, and as for a, a bibliography, there's actually there's a general bibliography for the for the project um, on our website, and we we haven't. We haven't done sort of specific. Um, we haven't put together specific bibliographies for each um, um, for each panel or each, um, each day. Oh, well, yeah, really. yeah. webinar. Um, but that's yes. It's um, very much a work in progress. So, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you can you can always um, write to us and, and ask if you if there are specific things um, that you'd like. Uh, yeah, um, you can always get that from us um, by writing to us directly if you'd like to. Okay. And it will um, be updated. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, there will be updates. <laughs> um, okay, I think I think we're ready to get started. Um, so hello and uh, welcome or welcome back um, to this, um, uh, the third panel of this conference on humans at, as footnotes in time and space. Um, this is the second step in a three part project devoted to the deconstruction of anthropocentrism and its consequences for research mainly in um, the humanities and human sciences. Um, and you can find, find out more about this um, on our website um, um, so two housekeeping notices. Um, so first, yes, um, as I, I just said, uh, previous panels were recorded um, and they'll be available on, on YouTube. Um, the links will be on our website. Um, the links for the first um, um, day conference uh, um, that took place in back in November and December are already um, available, so you can, um, you can find them there. Um, Oh, um, also, yes, um, questions. So we'll have um, uh, the entire panel, just three papers in a row, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. So you can either raise your hand um, at the end, or you can, if you're thinking about something and you don't want to um, just miss that moment, you can just um, post any question you might have um, in the chat box, or if you don't have a mic, um, that works, um, just um, post it in the chat box and, um, and we can read it out for you um, at the end if you'd like. Right, um, I don't think I've forgotten anything. Today, um, we are going to enjoy a panel on anthrodecentric stories. Um, and our first speaker is Will McKenzie, um, who's a lecturer at the Université de Lorraine, so a close colleague of mine. Um, Will McKenzie teaches English at the EU de Charlemagne. Um, he's the co-editor of Shakespeare and I, and author of The Student Guide to Shakespeare. And he has published articles on Renaissance obscenity, uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, and A Lover's Complaint, as well as critical th theory. Um, and his research interests include the history of narcissism from Shakespeare's time to ours. Um, and his paper today is entitled Shakespeare's Spirits and our Anthrodecentered Zeitgeist. Um, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Diane. Thank you for that introduction and thank you uh, to everybody for inviting me and thank you to everybody to coming to hear this talk. Um, can everybody hear me okay? No? Okay, so um, I'm just going to share the screen then. <clears throat> Okay, so um, <clears throat> anthrodecentrism uh, may function as a continuation of a series of terms like zeitgeist, postmodernism, or posthumanism, which identify and label distinct, unique features of a new chapter in an ongoing modernity. I say it functions as a continuation because earlier paradigms have also identified decentering as characteristic of contemporary life. Jean-François Lyotard in 1978 identified postmodern notions of truth, which rejected the notion that truth claims could be verified according to a single central reality, suggesting instead that knowledge was discernible as such according to its influence upon global market forces, decentered from nation states to an economy dominated by multinational corporations. In Postmodernism, or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, 1984, Frederick Jameson saw this new decentered global framework as determinant of a decentering de of that formerly centered subject or psyche. Key questions of anthrodecentering, whether the psyche be is central to the human, the human to the nation, the nation to the planet, our planet to the universe, can be and have been traced yet further back to the time of Shakespeare, the high to late Renaissance. As is well known, and as Vincent and Diane mentioned yesterday, uh, Sigmund Freud, in the 18th of his lectures in his general introduction to psychoanalysis, 1917, places his own discoveries at the end of a series that undermines the naive self-love, uh, naive, naive and eigenliebe of humanity, Menscheid. Uh, Freud sees this tradition of thought starting with Nicholas Copernicus and continued by Charles Darwin. For Freud, Copernicus's ideas challenged anthropocentrism in its literal sense, the geocentrism that physically locates man's home planet at the spatial center, Mittelpunkt, of the universe. Then uh, Darwin's idea of evolution challenged anthropocentrism more figuratively the creation privilege expressed in Genesis book one, uh, verse uh, 26. And here is the King James translation. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. In this narrative then, the time of Shakespeare born 21 years after Copernicus's death sees the effective historical start of anthrodecentrism. But Freud dismisses or strategically forgets efforts over this period to recenter the human, to reposition man as the center and master of creation, as when Francis Bacon in 1620 pointedly reprises man's creation privilege in the new Arganon, uh, aphorism uh, 59. Let the human race, race recover that right over nature, which belongs to it by divine bequest. As if in response, historians like Stephen Toulmin and Shakespeare critics like Hugh Grady have nuanced smoothly linear and teleological views like Freud's of this 500 year span, positing instead a kind of enlightenment sandwich where Shakespeare's pre-centered era is akin to Freud's decentered era either side of man's efforts, such as Bacon's, Isaac Newton's, or the thinkers of the Enlightenment, to understand even master nature via the faculties of observation, reason, or induction. This historical story from Shakespearean uh, proto-anthropocentrism to Enlightenment anthropocentrism to contemporary anthrodecentrism presupposes that at any historical given point, one set of beliefs may predominate over another. One such belief is the belief in magic. Keith Thomas's landmark study saw in the centuries after Shakespeare, the decline of magic. 
And Max Weber saw the development of modernity as the Entsauberung der Welt, literally the, the magification of the world from Zauber, spell or sorcery, but usually translated into English as disenchantment. And to simplify somewhat, as magic declined, value-free instrumental reason slotted into its place. Rationality became, by definition, whatever enables its reasoner to dominate nature, including his fellow humans, heedless of any longer term or less self-centered consequences. The most notorious illustration and example of this in Shakespeare's time is Machiavellianism. Machiavellianism is noticeably disenchanted in the Weberian sense, religious belief is simply a tool to be manipulated for worldly ends, and value-free, amoral. Machiavelli scandalously uncouples the centuries-old Ciceronian link of the useful and honourable, arguing that you can commit dishonourable acts and they may still be useful to you. Grady's argument that Shakespeare critiques this proto-modern Machiavellianism, alongside the idea from Walter Benjamin that the past and the present may be allegories of each other, allows him to justify to historicists what he terms controversially a presentist Shakespeare criticism. A criticism whose center of gravity, as Terence Hawke puts it, is in the present, not the past. While the diagnostic terms for this present, from Grady's postmodern to today's anthrodecentrism, have considerable historical and thematic overlap, not least in the way that they both celebrate and lament the present era ambivalently, the shift to anthrodecentrism conveys, and importantly, a yet stronger sense of contemporary bewilderment, an implied nostalgic wish or need to recenter. And I would argue that this need links dialectically to disenchantment in its various senses. For example, uh, the value-free competitiveness of the decentered globalized financial markets, we see this with GameStop today, um, presciently described by Lyotard, led to a 2008 crash that in turn decentered people's lives by taking their jobs and homes away. Explaining perhaps the markedly nostalgic phrasing of the new nationalism that arose, take back control, make America great again damaging but successful appeals to something like a totemic national center, an abstract, even magical, collective national spirit. This inquiry into anthrodecentrism and Shakespeare spirits supplements not only avowedly presentist inquiries like Grady's into modern and postmodern disenchantment and enchantment, but also the collection of essays, Spiritual Shakespeare's, edited by Ewan Fernie. Fernie's idea of present-ism is existential as well as historical, advancing the notion of a more centered, spirited human presence with agency and volition, a presence challenged by more determinist concepts like Foucauldian power, the Freudian unconscious, and Lacanian structuralist and post-structuralist ideas of language. Justifying the project in 2005, Fernie declared that we live in a much in a, we live in a time much changed from Jean-Francois Lyotard's postmodern condition. It was certainly true that the still rawly recent terrorist attacks of te September the 11th, 2001, by religious fundamentalists, had shocked the postmodern notion that after the Cold War, political leaders would ultimately replace the religious or ideological meta narratives on which so many have centered their lives with a progressively globalized and thus decentered secular liberal market democracy. But much changed is not completely changed. The intervening years have shown that we are still in the post-truth space that Lyotard foresaw, where variously magical and variously rational kinds of truth appear in an accelerating media culture as equivalents, where fake news can take on cultishly conspiratorial followings celebrities and commodities are worshipped as near deities and Snapchat filters transform us into elves and to sprites. Perhaps then today's center of gravity invites us to retroject backwards new parallels with the Shakespearean age 
where mentions of fairies and spirits were more prominent in English literature than any other. But Erasmus also linked such superstition to low birth and poor education. These ambivalent early modern views on the enchanted nature seem to chime especially with this disorienting year of COVID-19, frequently attributed to man's dangerously irreverent mistreatment of natural habitats. A selective verbal analysis of how Shakespeare uses the word spirit helps illustrate various relations between themes of human centeredness, magic, enchantment, and the supernatural or superhuman. Important uses include, obviously, ghost, I am thy father's spirit, from Hamlet, and by elaboration, the anima that differentiates living beings from their dead bodies, bend up every spirit to its full height, from Henry V, or there's a great spirit gone, from Antony and Cleopatra. Spirit is the element that experiences the pleasures and torments of the afterlife, which bathes in fiery floods. This explains the words near pro synonymous proximity with soul in time of Athens. Why, this is the world's soul and just of the same piece is every flatterous spirit. In Shakespeare then, spirit also means a person's inherent central quality, as in manly spirit, akin to modern terms like character or personality, as in Desdemona's spirit so still and quiet. This idea of persons being enchanted simply by dint of being alive is reworked comically in Henry V part two, when the drunkard Sir John Falstaff says drinking sherry uh, calls his little petty spirits to arm. Recalling the words modern alcoholic sense as in spirited with wine in Henry V, Falstaff insists that his spirits are internal, personal, centered within him, but also semi-autonomous subject to external material stimuli and closely connected to the faculty for lively responsive thought or wit, compare French spirituel. For example, Falstaff practices upon Mistress Quickly's spirit when duping her for love and money. And in Taming of the Shrew, spirit also means the verbal display of such wit. I'll woo her with some spirit when she comes. The ideas of spirit being intellectual and materially stimulated is especially strong in Love's Labour's Lost, as a lady's glance ignites the nimble spirits in the arteries, a sense that keys into the humoral physiologies current in Shakespeare's time. But this more materialist humoral dimension illustrates that spirit in Shakespeare is not only anthropocentrically personal, possessed by one person alone as a defining characteristic, it may also freely pass between persons porously. In the famously fierce denunciation of sex in Sonnet 129, the expense of spirit in a waste of shame, spirit means both anima and sperm, as the homophone of waste, W-A-S-T-E, and a woman's waste makes clear. Spirit can therefore be transmitted across generations as when Orlando says in As You Like It defiantly that my father's spirit grows strong within me. This super personal sense may be yet more wide ranging, universal, from spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou from Twelfth Night, to revolutionary insurrection, as when Cassius predicts Brutus will start a spirit as well as Caesar. The semantic play of the Shakespearean word spirit is therefore itself a kind of decentering and recentering force. Spirit is intimately, even definitively personal, but it also connotes uh, the self-obliterating sensation of love or the frenzy of mob rule. This protean ambiguity informs the sense of spirit as actor, prominent in Henry V, when the chorus apologizes that these upraised spirits will never emulate on stage the true glory of the Battle of Agincourt because they are only flat. So spirit also means an on-stage being and the theatrical power that he, she or it may elicit. With this more physical embodied performative dimension in mind, I turn to three of Shakespeare's most famous spirits, Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Ariel and the Tempest, and poor Tom and King Lear, exploring how they expose humans as mere metaphorical footnotes in space and time in a way that extends, I would argue, to the play's effects on the audience beyond. Most obviously, 
Puck and Ariel repeatedly direct people around the stage space confusedly. Puck scares off the amateur Armazan players by transforming the weaver Bottom's head into an ass's head. He then turns invisible and calls each Athenian lover by imitating another's voice so that the four may be reconciled in the same onstage spot. Ariel similarly imitates human voices to control them and makes humans awake or fall asleep at will. He also frightens them by transforming into a harpy or pack of dogs. Frequently invisible and demonstrably more powerful than humans, these spirits nonetheless confound human senses of scale in their small size, implicitly challenging Protagoras's ancient maxim, man is the measure of all things, an important influence on Renaissance humanism and thence anthropocentric enlightenment thought. Spirits or fairies, the words are used in dream near interchangeably, have names like cobweb, moat and mustard seed, are scared of beetles and interact with butterflies. Ariel likewise compares himself to flowers and insects. As well as being able to shrink himself to near invisible smallness, Ariel hints in his closing song, after regaining his freedom from his master Prospero, at a more enchantedly intimate, literary spiritual relationship with nature that he can now enjoy again, interfusing with flowers, cross-pollinating the island, where the bee sucks, there suck I. With similar fluidity, Puck may transform himself into a horse, a hound, a hog, a headless bear, while Titania, the fairy queen, seems telepathically attuned to the natural world's sufferings, lamenting the moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower. In many ways then, spirits work to undermine human beings' Adamic pretensions that they are distinct from, even superior to, the rest of nature. Puck mockingly compares the humans he has tormented to geese and choffs. Ariel comforts Ferdinand, who thinks that his father Alonso is drowned by singing that Alonso's bones are now of coral made. Coral a substance that, as Shannon Kelly reminds us, betokened in the Renaissance permanence, preciousness, Christ's passion and resurrection. Puck observes that his tricks may blur human and natural worlds more physically and painfully when briars and thorns snatch. But perhaps the most powerful Shakespearean illustration of nature's powerful invasion into human body space, as if in revenge for anthropocentric arrogance, is poor Tom in King Lear. Edgar, the Duke of Gloucester's virtuous son, framed by his Machiavellian brother Edmund and banished, disguises himself as near naked beggar poor Tom. He grinds his face with filth and spikes himself with briars. It is as if he, like Puck and Ariel, wants to merge wholly with the natural space around him. This affinity perhaps ex explains um, why Lear's terrified fool repeatedly mistakes him for a spirit. Howling into a raging storm, mimicking its terrifying force, poor Tom's mad confessions of lust and gambling alternate as if to atone with descriptions of ingesting even the foulest pieces of nature quasi-eucharistically. Poor Tom that eats cow dung, you old rat, ditch dog, greeks the green mantle of the standing pool. Laurie Shannon argues that Tom, thus abjected, unravels the species pretensions of humanity. While Simon Palfrey suggestively sees him, poor creature of earth, as emblematic of universal creaturely life, as opposed to individuated biological life. Consider Tom's non near nonsensical moan, Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. Pillicock is an Elizabethan slang term for penis, and Pillicock Hill, by inference, links metaphorically the landscape with the moon, the womb. Precise single meaning is impossible to discern, but Tom seems to imply a dismissive God's eye view of a mass of humans, generated as they are by the expense of spirit, or what Tom calls the act of darkness. The hill, Palfrey argues, is an accumulation of biodegraded remnants, fossils of pillicocks from which Tom arises, to which he will return and upon which he now sits. 
Shakespeare's spirits, therefore, do not merely undermine human beings' sense of place by displacing them in strange environments and, remind, and reminding them of uh, the near magical power of the natural world. Via regenerative coral bones or the super personal time of creaturely life, they also unsettle reflexively human senses of time, such as the felt lifetime and muscle memories of an individual mortal body, seasonal rhythms, the rhythms and um, the festive cal cal calendars, daily work routines, genealogical and ge generational rhythms, the rhythms and patterns of legible speech. Titania notes that her conflict with Oberon over a little changing boy has altered the seasons, disturbed the lunar cycle, and the nine man Morris dances and quaint mazes have ceased, breaking a harmony between natural cycles and human celebration. Puck intermingling uh, uh, Celtic and agrarian fairy traditions disturbs the shorter cycles of the working day by making milk skim, beer spill, and farm workers fall over. Poor Tom embodies comparable breaks in human time. Edgar's generational genealogical birthright has been usurped by his brother, while Tom's garbled cries make a nonsense of syntactical sequence. And vexed by the foul fiend, his speech is sourced from Samuel Harsnett's accounts of exorcisms, Tom seems to instead to ventriloquize hell itself, torment unending, a sense of time that humans might fearfully intuit, but never as mortals fully know. By way of conclusion then, this paper has explored various meanings of Shakespearean spirit by supplementing the ethos, methodology and historiography of certain strands of presentist criticism. It has suggested that the terminological shift from post-modernity to anthrodecentrism continues the argument that modern rationality is antagonistic to superstition, enchantment and magic, but also emphasizes contemporary bewilderment, the need, often nostalgic, to find a center for interpreting and grasping the world, as well as the urgently ecological stakes of rethinking humanity's relation to the green world. Shakespeare's spirits polyvalently reactivate the sense that the natural world is enchanted, ambivalently blurring the psychological and physical contours of individual human beings, maybe exposing them as mere footnotes in time and space. Through these overlapping processes, a new sense of collective organic creaturely life may be glimpsed. And given Shakespeare's enormous global cultural influence, even observed, even respected. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Will, for this um, fascinating uh, presentation, um, which I think is a um, great way of sort of opening this panel, right? Because you, you give us so much in terms of historical, um, um, historical perspective and cultural as well, of course. Um, um, given the, as you just said, the sort of influence that um, Shakespeare exerts um, on all, um, all, sorry, um, English speaking authors. Um, right, so um, as I said um, earlier, we're gonna have the questions at the end. So uh, keep them in mind um, if you'd like. And without further ado, I'll, I'm gonna introduce um, Emily, so um, our second speaker today is Emily Valézac. Um, she's a lecturer at Université Lumière Lyon 2. Um, she's a specialist of contemporary British literature and has devoted articles to the works of Angela Carter, A.S. Byatt, Sarah Hall, Rose Tremaine and Jeanette Winterson. Um, she's the author of Rose Tremaine, A Critical Introdu Introduction um, with Paul Grave Macmillan. And she's currently working on a book entitled Reading Realism with New Feminist Materialism, Contemporary British Women's Writing for, um, uh, sorry, uh, Contemporary British Women's Writing, and she's writing that for Bloomsbury. Um, and today she is here to tell us about um, anthropomorphism versus an anthropocentrism, contemporary short stories as onto stories, onto stories. Um, right, so Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I'd like to start by thanking you, uh, Estelle, Sarah and Diane for uh, organizing those uh, conference days. 
but uh, uh, really, um, I think, relevant to our current situation. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so that's just, it's just going to be me. I, I try to make that as dynamic as I can. Um, so in his 2017 lectures on the new climate regime, uh, published uh, as Facing Gaia, uh, Bruno Latour um, contrasts um, Galileo's conception of an expanding universe that led us to consider the infinity of space with the current climate crisis, forcing us to re-examine the inescapability of our finite earthbound dependence on the planet we live on. And so the Anthropocene is this paradoxical view of the human as one agent among a myriad other earthlings, while being at the same time akin to a geological force in the planetary changes wrought by its industrial engineering. And in his first conference, Latour also sheds light on the lobbying discredit of science carried out by the climate skeptics based on the divide between scientific facts and moral values. Because he says the description of alarming facts would entail a political prescription of collective actions. So the climate skeptics by denying the facts voided the possibility of political action based on bringing about the accountability of the polluters. So this divorce between science and politics is also highly relevant uh, to the current COVID crisis in which scientists uh, forcefully denied their own competence in decision-making while politics relied solely on medical science and epidemiology to act. So how is that relevant to today's discussion on anthrodecentrism? Well, it testifies to a crisis that concerns epistemology, politics, and ontology. Uh, and so adopting a post-human perspective that decenters the human subject means upsetting the inherited Cartesian dualism splitting science between observer subject and observed object. Thus, according new values and potentially legal representation to the non-human world. And finally, reinventing our way of being in the world. So such an ambitious project calls for treasure troves of imagination and that's where literature comes in. So the stories uh, that I want to discuss with you today uh, problematize those issues, starting with the science question. Um, all right, so A Stone Woman by A.S. Byatt. So this was a short story that was published in the collection Little Black Book of Stories in 2003, uh, materializes the split between observer and observed from the very start of the story, when the protagonist, Enos, who is turning to stones, decides to record her transformation with the detachment of the scientific observer while being the subject of the metamorphosis. So she's, at, at first, she splits herself to keep at bay the contemplation of her own mortality as she first expects the transmogrification to ultimately end with her own death by petrification. Similarly, in uh, Alice Smith's short story, The Beholder, which was published in 2013, uh, whose very title evokes the observational eye, the first person narrator visits her doctor for an unidentified chest pain uh, that he first assumes is due to a depression as the narrator has lost her father, her job, and ended her marriage. 
but once she turns into a medical oddity, um, uh, growing branches over her body, she shuns the medical funnels and enjoys her transformation. Um, and I'd like to talk also to you about the story by Sarah Hall called Bees, which was published in 2011. And in this story, once again, we've got a split. Hmm? The second person narrator is also undergoing a crisis, which the use of the second person uh, characterizes as a sort of internal split. Uh, after escaping an abusive marriage, the narrator sounds like she's in a state of shock, as though some part of her has fled from her body. I quote from the story, um, something rose up inside your chest, it split you open, it tugged itself through the walls of muscle, slid to the floor, and moved off into the crowd. So this missing part in the story is characterized as and I quote again, that prime red aspect, that historical red piece that clawed away and is missing somewhere now, that urgeful hybrid creature carrying flames along, along its back as it moves. So this missing part of the narrator actually reappears at the end of the story uh, in the form of a hunting fox uh, with the, its a uh, fiery imagery, I quote the, the story, as if the creature has been stoked up from the surroundings, its fur like a furnace, it shakes its red head furiously. Um, so this story actually reads as a forerunner to uh, Sarah Hall's prize -win winning uh, story, Mrs. Fox, uh, which uses the point of view of the husband to record the transfer transmogrification of his wife into a fox. And finally, the last story that I'm going to discuss is A.S. Byatt's latest story that was published in The Guardian in 2013, and, and which is called Sea Story. And this is the, uh, um, uh, in this story, you've got the human narrative, which contrasts science as embodied by Laura, who is an oceanographer, uh, and romance embodied by Harold, who is a literature student smitten with Laura on their first and only meeting. And I'll come back to the other part of this story later. <coughs> so the writers, as I said, so you, you've noticed that, that the writers are experimenting with focalization. And this, to me, aligns with the feminist epistemology's challenge to the disembodied scientific intelligence uh, characterized by Donna Haraway as, uh, I quote, seeing everything from nowhere. So the use, especially of the medical background in uh, Smith and Byatt stories, underlines uh, the writer's central preoccupation with the body. And all three writers, Byatt, Hall, and Smith, uh, depict a moment of crisis, almost literally, as the word's etymology designates a turning point in a disease, um, a change, which in indicates either recovery or death. Um, so the literary imagination fosters a new understanding of science as feminist objectivity, which means the subjective experience is owned to reclaim some truth through analogical connections. Uh, in addition to this, the recurrent motif of the metamorphosis testifies to a paradigmatic change in both our epistemological and ontological relation to the world. So for instance, the story A Stone Woman draws on a multiplicity of analogies which allow the readers to variously interpret the story and there's no fixed meaning. So you can variously interpret the story of Innis as a story about menopause or a revision, well, or end, uh, a revision of Ovid's Pygmalion because 
Ines is helped by an Icelandic sculptor to come to terms with her transformation. Uh, it's also a tribute to Northern myth because at the end she joins the trolls in the mountains of Iceland. Uh, but also obviously as an Anthropocene story picturing the human as a geological creature. And what's very interesting in, in uh, this story by Bayer is the taxonomic writing uh, of the story, which displays uh, numerous lists of stone words. And this taxonomic writing actually parallels the non-human conversion of Ines, whose, I quote, new eyes could not quite bring the dancing black letters to have any more meaning than the spiders and ants which scurry around her feet. So the words themselves become non-human. They become dancing bodies on the page. And in Smith's story also, you've got this relish for words as living entities. Uh, so for instance, at first, you've got this list of medical branches gone a bit crazy. Uh, which testify both to the doctor's puzzlement at the narrator's condition and to the narrator's own incomprehension of the medical discourse. Um, I quote from the story. I'm going to refer you to several consultants at the following clinics, oncology, ontology, dermatology, neurology, urology, etymology, impology, expology, informology, Mentalology, ornithology, and apology. All right, so the, the logos, the discourses, they do not help the narrator, but the words do. Uh, because once she has identified the tree variety growing on her body, which is a lycidus, she barely listens to the medical secretary that she's got on the phone, and instead, she starts enjoying seeing buds blossoming on her body and she enjoys describing them. And words as non-human agencies are also operative in bees because as I said already, it's the red imagery that draws a parallel between the fox and the woman's organ, which the, the reader might guess is her heart. Hmm? But interestingly enough, it's not a metaphor, but a metonymy, uh, which emphasizes analogical contiguity, or uh, to put it in Dulles terms, an assemblage. And so the taxonomic lists, whether they are real as in Bayard's uh, story or imagined as in uh, Smith, they challenge the human ordering of the world at the same time as they reinterpret the original impulse of taxonomy as analyzed, for instance, by Foucault, namely that of drawing an analogy between words and things, between language and living creatures. And the connecting element is located in the morphing body themselves. Um, the geomorphic wonder that Ines turns into parallels the, um, sorry, um, excuse me, the, yeah, the parallels the, the body sprouting stones and the text shooting lists of stone words so that the text and the body are, are closely related. Um, and it's, it's the same in uh, Smith's story, the botanic oddity of the beholder uh, similarly has the narrator's body budding and the text burgeoning with descriptive words. And so description is paramount in writing a new order of things. So this new order upsets space and time frames as the stories address the paradoxes of approaching the non-human. The beholder's metamorphosis, for instance, testifies to the fast forward blooming of tree buds because the, the narrator, she, she's very sorry because she fails to actually witness the budding of, of uh, 
of those, uh, the blooming of those tree buds. But she vows that she's going to spend her life waiting for the right moment when she can actually witness this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, blossoming. Uh, and, and at the same time, this encourages her to revisit her human memories. Uh, she's, at the very end of the story is all about the, the memories uh, that she has, and she says she's doubling back on herself. And Ines, uh, in a stone woman, Ines' geological becoming modifies both her sensory and her cognitive perceptions as she starts to think, I quote, stony thoughts. Her oxymoronic transformation with petrification actually animating her with the new gushing life of a volcano is mirrored in the time paradoxes of Iceland with its everlasting daylight. And so the descriptions of Inis' new body emphasize paradoxes of slowness and velocity, solidification and movability. So I would say that the stories resonate with Donna Haraway's proposal to replace the term Anthropocene with Cthulhucene to designate the time spaces of multi-species assemblages and to replace the term post-human with compostist to highlight the interconnectivity of bodies. And so why does she want to replace those words? It's because in those words, you still have the word human. Huh? So it's, it's to finally truly decenter the human. And for Haraway, in this process, storytelling is essential to introduce new knowledge. And I like it that she compares storytelling to a muscle. Um, and, so, and so the becomings in, in those stories that I'm borrowing, uh, obviously from Bulu's uh, vocabulary, uh, the becomings in those stories and becoming animal, becoming stone, becoming vegetal, outlined, outlined sorry, a new ontological understanding of the human critters. And so there's, there's also, so I, I would like to refer also to Jane Bennett, uh, who is also calling for some new forms of storytelling uh, that she calls, and this is how I, uh, this is the title that I gave to my paper. She calls them onto stories. Uh, so from ontology, uh, onto stories, uh, uh, by which she means narratives that would picture what she calls the thing power of non-human agencies. And so by its uh, latest short story, Sea Story, uh, is completely in line with this uh, intent of you know, depicting the thing power of non-human agencies. It starts, as I said, as an ordinary human story about Harold falling in love at first sight with Laura, uh, who goes away overseas to study the ocean, and she leaves him with the wrong phone number, okay? And so Harold, who uh, was born by the sea and who is romantically involved with the sea imagery, sends her a love letter in a plastic bottle. And so then the story unexpectedly becomes the story of the journey of the Perrier bottle at sea. All right, so it depicts the distraction wrought by the single bottle on the ocean life through its zoomorphic shape-shifting. I, I quote from Bayet's text uh, about the bottle, she says, she writes, its walls furring and feathering so that the fish and the birds mistake the bottle for edible matter and they choke to death. And so the text describes the lethal inclusion of the bottle in the food chain, illustrating the, illustrating the thing power of plastic and it also offers a anacrasis of the Atlantic gyre that uses alliterative uh, hypologies to paint the plastic invasion of the oceans of the ocean with, I quote, shoals of toothbrushes. 
and a sense of threats and fragments from the sense of the world's washing machines. Is a, a, um, uh, and so the end of the story summarizes the human destinies of Harold and Laura better to contrast their short lifespan with the, I'm quoting, by she uses the adjective sempiternal life, cy life cycle of plastic myrtles. So it's the untrue story of a non compostable material. And it's also a fable on human contradictions because it's loaded with irony, contrasting, especially at uh, the irony is all in the use of focalization. So for instance, you've got this contrast between the internal uh, uh, focalization on Harold's romantic view of nature as some kind of impermanent force uh, and the external Focalization, which depict him choosing to send his message in a plastic bottle. No, big contradiction here. Uh, and it's the same with, you know, the internal focalization, which mimics Howard's infatuation with Laura, who he depicts as a mermaid. And the external focalization, clearly messaging that she's not interested and maybe potentially even un uncomfortable because. Uh, she gives him the wrong phone number. Um, and so the parallel misunderstanding of the sea and the woman uh, in romantic terms uh, contrasts with the scientific lexicon used in the rest of the story to represent the ocean ecosystem, as well as the plastic material itself as a new alien agent in this interconnected web. So the stories, they draw complex web of agencies through analogies. And this explains the bees in whole story, because I've told you about the fox, but maybe everyone's wondering, but why is the story called bees in that case? So the, the title bees uh, actually aligns with the story's overall poetics of contiguous alliances, because it helps further the parallel between abused women and threatened species. Um, so Hall is adopting here an eco-feminist perspective by establishing a correspondence between the defense of women's rights and that of the environment. So raising the issue of human embodiment and environmental embeddedness. So the narrator, uh, she flees to London and she's housed at a friend's place and she spends her days in a small urban garden. And, and while spending her day in the garden, she notices that, that there's a great number of dead bees in the garden. And so she wonders about the possible causes of death uh, for, uh, of the bees. And the various explanations that she comes up with actually are echoed further along in the text in her own experiences. So for instance, she, uh, uh, when she considers how the bees may have been suffocated by, I quote, mites in their throats. Uh, this mirrors the later forceful description of how she had to submit to forced fellatios with her husband. I quote, the tenderness at the back of your throat from choking on them being forced to. So Hall is very, uh, Hall gives very vivid depictions of abuse uh, through verbal and physical assault, like uh, anal rape. Mm -hmm. She does not relent from giving quite forceful de depictions. I quote, complaining, if you weren't wet enough, pulling out and moving it into a tighter place. So the reason why uh, the narrator ultimately flees from her husband is actually the complicity of the local authorities in denying her complaint for domestic violence. And so she, uh, Hall, and, and also the narrator, she doesn't want to get pregnant. So uh, she, she's on the pill, but she's had an abortion. And Hall uses the bees to evoke the forced pollination, I quote, of the almond industry, bees flown in on jumbo jets to pollinate. And so this resonates obviously with the issue of abortion that, as I said, is broached later on in the text and parallels the exploitation of female and animal bodies. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, she also mentioned diseases as a potential cause of death. So uh, with the death of the bees possibly caused by infected hives, I'm quoting again. And this echoes uh, the narrator's experience in London of unprotected, unprotected sex, which leads to a bladder infection. And finally, the extinction of bees uh, brings up uh, that the subject of human extinction. And I quote again from the text, is this the beginning of the Holocaust that will lead to the death of grass and cattle, the collapse of the pollinated food chain? So the confederation of bees, woman, fox in Hall's short story resonates powerfully today as scientists and philosophers all over the world are calling for a new understanding of the nature culture continuum and justice claims, as you know, are being made on behalf of non-human entities to grant legal rights to natural phenomena like uh, rivers and mountains, for instance. And so by making parallels between women's rights and animal rights, Hall makes clear the feminist legacy in post-human critical thinking, which is that collapsing the borderline between subjects and objects, human and non-human, nature and culture, makes way for the new, I quote, images of thought that philosopher Rosie Bredotti uh, feels that we are currently in need of. Um, and so the bees woman analogy enlarges the comprehension of the interdependence of bios and zoe by tackling the issues of reproduction and diseases, sex and death. So Bredotti's post-human endeavor at bringing together bios, so bios would be the self-reflexive uh, political life of human citizen, and Zoe, uh, which is the raw force of life, echoes the de-anthropocentric views put forward in the stories. And the fact that Hall is not using a metaphor empowers the image of the fleeing organ as I'm quoting the words of Sarah Hall, a strong need. She likes to, to use that kind of imagery. It's very, very powerful in her writing. Um, so strong need, uh, an expression of Zoe materialized in the wild animal, the fox. And so it brings to mind, uh, again, the Lerza and the concept of the body without organs, which uh, Bredotti uses to signify the virtual potentialities of becoming animals. Um, I quote Gredotti, uh, forming anomalous and inorganic alliances, not Oedipal and hierarchical relations. <clears throat> so these unexpected assemblages, as Gredotti calls them, or isomorphism, which is the term that Jane Bennett uses to emphasize equality, uh, helps throw new lights on the, well, in the case of all the human animal relationship. Uh, it's not a relation that seeks to subordinate, but that looks for kindred mutations. And uh, well, in Mrs. Fox, she goes even further uh, because the husband narrator ultimately uh, quietly accepts the surrogate paternity of a litter of cubs. Um, so uh, Sarah Hall, she parallels anthropomorphism and zoomorphism. And we could say by it, she uses geomorphism and Smith goes with phytomorphism. And these metamorphoses conflate human and non-human timeframes to explore the paradoxes of the Cthulhuine web of interconnected bodies. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Emily. I just, um, I just thought, you know, it's amazing the sort of connections that already appear between um, papers. Um, that little story um, of the bottle that you were mentioning um, actually tied in very nicely with uh, the reading uh, that we had um, uh, by David Farrier yesterday, um, because he has he has a passage like that on sort of following. Uh, following a bottle to the bottom of the sea, um, in um, in in his book, um, the book he he read an excerpt from 
yesterday. Um, and I also really like the sort of connections with, um, you know, um, matters of transformation and metamorphosis and that, that sort of connection between um, nature and, and, um, and humans and our sort of um, integration into, into, but also transformation into um, um, natural non-human things uh, between the first two papers. I think that that's been working quite nicely. Um, Right, so uh, moving on to our third paper for today, um, Eloise uh, Thomas is a PhD student at Bordeaux Montaigne University. Um, their dissertation, um, Archive Empire Apocalypse, um, studies representations of history in 21st century US literature through a queer, feminist and decolonial lens. Um, and their recent and forthcoming articles discuss women's autobiographical writings, lesbian representation and poetics and politics of memory and the apocalypse in contemporary US culture. Right, and today, um, Eloise um, is going to talk to us about Schrodinger's Hello Kitty lunchbox, uh, dream crows, quantum theory, and the Anthropocene in Ruth uh, Ozeki's A Tale for the Time Being. Eloise, uh, the floor is yours. Can you all hear me? Great. Awesome. Um, so first of all, thank you to the organizers. I mean, it's been a terrific conference. I've been a delight listening to everyone. Um, and I'm actually super glad because um, the, the bottle you were mentioning, uh, Emily, in by its story, there is a similar uh, kind of idea in Ruth Ozeki's novel where she talks about the Pacific vortexes of you know, plastic and garbages that are absolutely huge, humongous on the Pacific. Um, and there's a whole thing about that in the novel. So I think there's like a really, really nice echo. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna start with a, a quick quote by the novel to kind of like, you know, plan the decor. Um, Ruth and Oliver are, you know, the, the two, um, part of the two uh, part of the main characters and they live in this tiny little island off the coast of British Columbia um and so the the they describe you know, what they've done to the house they've been living there for 15 years so in a futile attempt to domesticate the landscape Ruth planted European climbing roses around the house Oliver planted bamboo the two species quickly grew up into a densely tangled thicket so that soon it was almost impossible to find the entrance to the house if you didn't already know where it was the house seemed in danger of disappearing, and by then, the meadow was beginning to shrink too, as the force encroached like a slow-moving wave, threatening to swallow them completely. Oliver wasn't worried. He took the long view. Anticipating the effects of global warming on the native trees, he was working to create a climate change forest on 100 acres of clear cut, owned by a botanist friend. He planted groves of ancient, native, uh, ancient natives, species that had been indigenous to the area, during the Eocene thermal maximum some 55 million years ago. Imagine, he said, palms and alligators flourishing once again as far north as Alaska. This was his latest artwork, a botanical intervention he called the Neo-Eocene. He described it as a collaboration with time and place whose outcome neither he nor any of his contemporaries would ever live to witness, but he was okay with not knowing. Patience was part of his nature and he acted this lot as a short-lived mammal scurrying in and out amid the roots of the giants. But Ruth was neither patient nor accepting, and she really liked to know. After a few short years, 15 to be exact, breathed by his count and terminable by hers, surrounded by all this vegetative rampancy, she was feeling increasingly unsure of herself. She missed the built environment of New York City. It was only in an urban landscape amid straight lines and architecture that she could situate herself in human time and history. As a novelist, she needed this. She missed people. She missed human intrigue, drama, and power struggles. She needed her own species, not to talk to necessarily, but just to be among as a bystander in a crowd or anonymous witness. But here on the sparsely populated island, human culture barely existed and then only in, as the thinnest veneer. So I wanted to start with this quote because I do feel that it really translates um, translate really well what the novel tries to do. So Ruth and Oliver are um, the main couple in the novel. Um, and I'll, I'll give a short um, summary of the novel right after. But um, so Ruth is a novelist. Oliver is an artist who works with forests. He works with trees. He works with nature, the natural environment. And I feel that like their opposite views of how to interact with nature 
really encapsulate um, one of the, the, the big questions raised by the novel. This idea of Oliver, you know, being patient, accepting his lot as a short-lived mammal, he's not even saying as a short-lived human, but as a short-lived mammal. He's not, I mean, human being, he is an animal. He is a human animal, but he is an animal all the same. And everything that Oliver does, he takes the long view. He takes kind of, he goes back to a time scale that is more planetary, that is more cosmic than human. While Ruth is very much embedded in the human drama of everyday life. She likes history. She likes to know. She likes to find out. Um, so this is, I think this really encapsulates, you know, kind of the, the stakes that the novel raises. So this paper is a kind of continuation of what I started exploring in a paper for the first Temporal Belongings um, Conference in Edinburgh in 2018. And it's also part of my broader PhD project where um, I work on 21st century North American literary representations of history and futurity. And you know, history and futurity obviously being shaped by the ways in which time is politically, socially, culturally understood, managed and regulated. And the argument that I wish to make using this novel, um, so uh, a tale for the time being, is that it models ways to decenter systems hierarchies and exploitation that compose uh, most of humanity's current mode of relation to the world, as you know, defined by the Anthropocene. I think like those are words that I don't need to define anymore. We've talked about them enough, uh, and I think that we've kind of um, seen what they cover. So, what does a novel talk about? So, its protagonist seems to be an avatar of the author. You know, she's a writer. She's named Ruth. She lives in an island off the coast of British Columbia. Um, and one day she finds on the beach uh, a Hello Kitty lunchbox that contains a diary of a young girl named um, Nao, short for Naoko, uh, as well as old landers and an antique watch. Ruth's husband Oliver, uh, who's this you know, artist interested in the environment and geology, just like the real Oliver, um, in the, the real Oliver who's a real husband of Ruth Ozeki. So Oliver deduces that the diary has probably been, um, you know, cast away, and he's, it's probably, you know, the very first of the debris borne by the current um, after the 2011 tsunami that struck the coast of Japan. So Ruth decides to read the diary, and the diary starts with now introducing herself to an imaginary reader and cheerfully declaring an intention to commit suicide. Uh, but not before she's told the stories that she needs to tell, and we gradually discover that, you know, she's this young teenager who grew up in the U.S. of Japanese parents. Uh, when the latter moved back to Japan, she it's a painful, complicated homecoming. She's bullied viciously by her fellow students and by her professors. She doesn't fit in. Um, and so that kind of, you know, whole um, bullying uh, experience results in alienation, um, self-endangering on her part in order to escape the violence that's inflicted on her. And in parallel, her father is unable to cope with the loss of a job as an engineer in the booming Californian tech industry. And we learn later on that he was fired because he refused to create code that would be used for military purposes. And as a result, he starts you know, withdrawing into himself, becoming a shut-in in Japanese culture. Um, so I just want to stop there really quick and you know, think about this idea that like the father sees how his work um, which seems to be, you know, he works on video games, if I remember correctly. Um, and so he understands the implications, the political, moral implications of his work. So he's already kind of like decentering himself as, you know, the creator, the co that he's working on, um, kind of decentering the, the authority that he has over the code as its offer, and seeing how it can escape him and then be turned into something that would be used to destroy other people. So even though he struggles to accept the fact, you know, that he, he was fired, he still maintains that it was the right moral position. Um, if he was so decentering himself, accepting the decentering of himself in that whole process of, you know, authority um, and authoriality, um, that was the right decision on the moral, uh, from a moral point of view in order to prevent, you know, further bloodshed, further uh, violence. So Nao's alienation starts finding some form of resolution once uh, she gets to meet her paternal great-grandmother, Jiko, who's a Zen Buddhist nun, um, and also a former anarchist and writer and a feminist, uh, probably bisexual. Um, it's like kind of all, all around this really badass woman. Um, Nao spends an entire summer at Jiko's temple up in the mountains, and it's kind of a revelation for her. She starts practicing meditation. She starts, you know, she moves 
a bit like Ruth and Oliver who moved from, you know, the built environment of New York City to this beautiful, gorgeous island of the coast of British Columbia, now understands, you know, moving, decentering himself herself from the human built environment of Tokyo to the temple in the mountains where she reconnects with, you know, what we call nature. She sees, you know, um, she connects with meditation, with Zen Buddhism through her um, great grandmother. She more generally develops greater awareness of herself and the world around her and her place within that world. So um, it's beginning to be less and less, you know, about her and about and more about, you know, how she is located in a web of net, uh, a network of connections, not only with other humans, but with other what she calls time beings. And we'll see what um, she means by time beings a little later. Um, and she also learns that Jiko's son, so now's father's uncle, was a kamikaze in World War II um, against his will. And she discovers his paper and his watch, which end up in the lunchbox. So that's what Ruth gets um, in the lunchbox. But um, when she returns home after the summer, however, she finds no proper resolution to her life. She becomes impatient with her father's suicidal tendencies. She feels powerless. So she also resolves to commit suicide. And that's the start of the diary that Ruth is reading. So much of now's story is left completely unresolved, you know, since it appears that Ruth and Oliver do not find a satisfying answer as to, you know, the mystery of how the lunchbox and its contents um, made their way to the Canadian coast or what happened to now after she started writing, uh, she stopped writing the, in the diary. And while writing, reading the diary, Ruth experiences several phenomena that seem to disrupt, you know, linear temporality. She admits, uh, she attempts to find several traces of Now's family online. However, her efforts to find more are continually thwarted. And as she nears the end of the diary, she finds that the final pages um, we have inexplicably gone blank, where I mean, she was sure that they had initially been crowded with writing. And then her dreams later on appear to take her back in time and materially intervene in Now's life with words returning then to the pages. Um, in parallel, her growing knowledge of quantum physics and uh, quantum mechanics gives her ways to reinterpret her interactions with events and people outside of linear teleological time, and it keeps at bay any attempt at um, a narrative of a real life resolution. And the novel ends on a letter that Ruth writes to Now, imagining what Now's life must be like as a young woman in Ruth's present. So the, the novel is rife with um, reflections on time, on history, what constitutes, you know, historical time. And it's also rife with considerations of, you know, where are we located in time, in space, and how are we, you know, located in the world. There is, so the first concept is the concept of a time being, where everyone, everything is a time being. Um, so now, uh, for example, now at the very beginning says, you know, uh, hi, my name is Now, and I'm a time being. A time being is someone who lives in time. And then we learn that words and stories are time beings as well. Um, time beings include, you know, all, I quote from uh, Now's diary, all the animals and other life forms like amoebas, viruses, and maybe even plants that have ever lived or ever will live, as well as all the extinct species. Um, so clearly this idea of time being um, thinking of herself as a time being is already displacing, you know, the, 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 the human being in her, um, in herself, because it's the definition for a time being is so capacious that really, if you count, you know, all the animals, all the plants, all the instinct species and so on and so on, all the viruses and so on, um, then the, the proportion of human beings among time beings is probably really tiny. So there's already this idea that by um, thinking of oneself, not you know, as one confined to one species as a human, but as a time being, someone who exists in time, and that time is not necessarily linear, um, since you know, time being includes also existing species, then there's already this um, decentering of um, humanity uh, at work. And so, Throughout the, no throughout the novel, uh, whether it's in Ruth's narrative or in Now's diary, we see new ways of thinking uh, about history and representing history that also decenter human agentivity as the primary driving force. Um, and these new modes of thinking about history kind of emphasize rather a, a relational mode of thinking. So it's not just about you know who does something, but 
okay, so who does something? How is this connected to what other time beings have done? How is this connected to the implications, the repercussions of what these um, time beings you know, will do in the future or what do they have done in the past? So it's this, it's this, um, it's this con continuous idea of thinking about history in a way that frees it up from you know, a linear theological um, narrative. You know, this is what happened and then this was what happened. And as a consequence, this is what happens. And one that kind of um, goes back to a spiral or loop um, type of narrative. And there is this constant idea as well that history can be changed. Um, that it's not just a matter of a point of view, but it is, um, history can be changed depending on the narrative of who represents history or who talks about history, obviously. Um, but also, and we're going to get into this with the idea of, you know, quantum physics and um, dreams as altering history, but history can be changed. So the next thing in, um, in the next point I want to talk about in the novel is that it is composed of unstable texts, um, unreliable voices, and that also works into the whole decentering of human agency and the human role in, in the vast world. Why? Because it forces us to question why we ascribe so much authority and so much legitimacy to the human point of view, to the human narrative of what happens. Um, there's you know several moments in the novel, novel for example, when um, Ruth, when she's reading Now's diary, she gives us a lot of um, uh, end notes uh, at, the, at the bottom of the page. For example, she says, you know, for more thoughts on Zen moments, see, see Appendix A, and she, you know, um, adds appendixes to her novel. Um, at some point, she also says, you know, uh, can find references. Is she making this up, talking about Now? So there is this constant idea of, you know, where... Um, who is speaking and can we trust them? Can we, is that voice really a reliable voice uh, or is it one of many voices, many different points of view? Uh, and a little later when Ruth starts um, realizing that you know the pages that she thought were filled with writing are now blank, she starts to wonder who is actually the reader and who is the writer here. Uh, I quote, who had conjured whom, was she the dream, was now the one writing her into being. So this forces us also to, again, interrogate the, um, the, 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 the connections that bind us together. So, and there is this um, saturation of dream um, semantics in the novel, you know, on the edge of becoming a dream. Uh, at some point, she says, she writes, uh, Ruth writes, a temporal stuttering, an urgent lassitude. So there is currently this idea of rethinking history, rethinking not just the past, but the present moment uh, through other logics than the simple historical narrative uh, linear teleology in order precisely to decenter human agentivity um, and, and agency in that history. Going back to Oliver, um, this ties into the fact that the whole novel sees the planet not as a background for human activity, not as a decor, but as a vast ecosystem. So obviously, as we've seen um, from the quote I, um, I read out loud from the very beginning of this presentation, Oliver is the champion of that um, of that vision of the world as a vast ecosystem. He is the one who truly understands everything as connected. And in this sense, he is very much connected to what Jiko is um, trying to teach now. She is trying to teach now that everything is connected, everything um, through Zen Buddhism, um, everything is connected. And so seeing the planet as a vast ecosystem and not just as a playground for humans to do whatever they want to do forces also a question of responsibility what do we owe each other what do we owe the world what do we owe also um non-human living beings that idea of you know how do we work with how do we connect how do we relate to other animals to plants 
in order to create an ecosystem type of environment and on one where we retain agency at the expense of everything else around us. And so this ties into Oliver's project, which forces us to reassess what we understand as time scales. You know, we are used to thinking about ourselves, about humanity on very human time scales, the, the time scale of human history. So we can envision, you know, 2000 years of history, um, even a little more than that. What Oliver does, however, is think about time scales in terms of billions of years, something that we usually cannot fathom. Uh, one, because our lifespan is so derisively you know, short compared to billions of years, but most of all, because it would force us to contend with the fact that we are a minuscule presence in the universe, that we are, may not be you know, the driving force that we imagine ourselves to be uh, as a result of capitalism, as a result of colonialism, and so on. And so Ruth is not, she's not entirely sold on that whole project, obviously. Uh, as she says, she's a novelist, she likes the built environment, she likes human drama, um, she, she needs to be within built environments that have other people so that she can watch them and that she can feel connected to them as human beings. But her encounter with Now's diary forces, us, forces her and us um, by the uh, same token to reassess that notably by providing her with um, guiding animals. So I, I mentioned dream crows in, um, in my title. There is in their garden, in, in Ruth and Olive's garden, a, a crow um, appears at some point, uh, right around the time when they found Now's diary. And they identify it as a jungle crow. So a more Japanese kind of bird um, and not a, a, a bird that's native to this uh, part of the, the Americas. And this presence, this eruption of a crow kind of becomes a running thread. Um, when Ruth has her first dream of Jiko um, at her temple in the mountains, she compares Jiko to a crow uh, with the robes, the dark robes that Jiko is wearing, Jiko resembles the crow. So the first encounter that Ruth has with Jiko is um, with a, a being who's not totally human and not totally animal, but kind of a liminal being. And that ties into the view that now has of her great grandmother, which uh, whom she calls um, a time being herself and like one of the, um, one of the, the, the most time beings that ever time being. So Jiko is an avatar of the crow or the crow is an avatar of Jiko. And the crow is going to appear again and again in Ruth's dreams. And in Ruth's dreams, what happens is that she reaches out um, into time, into the past, and she starts dreaming of things that happen to now, of uh, now's father, of the temple. And at some point she starts believing and we, we never get an answer. We never get a clear answer as to whether, you know, this is actually happening and we're in a kind of like magical realist uh, novel or whether this is all, you know, Ruth imagination. But Ruth starts believing that she's actually the one who put um, um, the, the watch and the letters in the box where they were to be found by now. She, uh, Belia, she's the one who through her dreams talked to now's father and convinced him to um, well, to get a grip and, you know, help his daughter, that kind of thing. And um, in a few, at a few, um, you know, one of those dreams, um, she starts, uh, she clearly starts, something goes wrong. Um, the, the, the dream just kind of gets warped and the crow is what saves her. And I'm going to read another quote here. Um, so she sees, um, she thinks she sees a, a crow. And then the word appears on the horizon, black against the unbearable light. And as it comes closer, it starts to turn and spiral, elongating its C to create a spine, rounding its O into a sleek belly, rotating its R to form a forehead with a wide open beak. It stretches wide, its wings flaps them once, twice, thrice, and then fully feathered, it starts to fly. So here we have a complete entanglement uh, between the, the writing life Ruth's mind, the dream, um, the liminal space of the dream, the crow, 
Um, and then Ruth goes on to write, it's a jungle crow come to save her. And the jungle crow, so the jungle crow appears time and time again. And a friend of Ruth and Oliver's starts suggesting that it might be a kind of spirit guide for Ruth, um, especially as crows appear in indigenous stories of um, the area as um, protectors, as guides, as the ones who allow human beings to live. Um, and there is, uh, in one of those stories, the grandmother who can um, shapeshift into a crow at will uh, manages to get fire to her granddaughter who got pregnant and who is threatened with being cast out from her tribe. So it's a kind of, it has echoes of Prometheus, but it's also anti-Prometheus because there, well, the grandmother for one uh, is not punished for her act. Instead, um, the um, granddaughter will, um, by the, uh, this act of generosity, the granddaughter survives and gives birth to um, what will become the indigenous tribe that has this, this story in their mythology. So it is very much a, a, a Genesis story. Um, and the crow is entangled in that. The crow is the spirit guide that allows not just the, the start of humanity in the mythology, but also that allows Ruth to understand how deeply she is connected to everything. Um, and the other type of animal that is that exists in this um, in this novel is, is a cat. It's uh, Pesto the cat, um, which I mean he was supposed to be called of the pest because uh, Ruth does not have you know have a great liking uh, for this cat. But he ended up being Pesto. He is Oliver's cat through and through. He adores um, Oliver. And the cat at some point disappears and they're so afraid that the cat has, you know, um, been eaten by a raccoon or something. Um, but the cat acts as another spirit guide in the second half of the novel, along with the crow, uh, because the cat is what drives um, Ruth to uncover more and more of the story behind Now's uh, diary. Um, and the cat is obviously also Schrodinger's cat. Um, and Schrodinger's cat plays, a, a as you know, the thought experiment plays a huge role in um, Ruth's uncovering uh, and untangling of um, Mao's narrative. She starts researching quantum physics. She starts understanding the parallels between quantum physics and Zen Buddhism as taught by um, Jiko, the great grandmother. Uh, this idea that everything is connected everything, the past influences the future, but also the, f the future influences the past. Um, in, um, she has several um, appendixes where uh, the per first appendix is called Zen Moments, um, where she recounts uh, a dream that she had with Jiko, who tells her uh, about um, what a moment is. Um, in my dream, I asked her, what on earth is a moment? A moment is a very small particle of time. It is so small that one day is made of 6,400,099,918 moments. When I looked it up afterward, I discovered that this was the exact number cited by Zen, cited by Zen master Dogen in his masterwork. Um, and so Jiko tells, um, tells Ruth to snap, to snap her fingers. And by snapping her fingers, she says that snap equals 65 moments. The grand reality of the Zen view of time becomes clear if you do the math, or you can just take Jiko's word for it. She leaned forward, adjusting her black frame glasses on her nose and peering through the thick murky lenses, and then she spoke once more. Um, if you start snapping your fingers now and continue snapping 98, uh, 98 million times, 463,077 times, Without stopping, the sun will rise and the sun will set and the sky will grow dark and the night will deepen and everyone will sleep while you are still snapping until finally, sometime after daybreak, when you finish up your um, snaps, you will experience a truly intimate awareness of knowing exactly how you spent every single moment of a single day of your life. That's what it means to be a time being. And just like that, you die. Um, so, and then the following appendix is about quantum physics. Um, and basically in that appendix, Ruth um, puts in parallel what she learns about Zen Buddhism and then what she learns about quantum physics. Uh, the properties, um, the, the, the phenomena of superposition um, by which a particle can be in two or more places or states at once, 
For example, Zen Master Dogen is both alive and dead. So it's not Schrodinger's cat anymore. It's Schrodinger's Zen Master, I guess. Um, but it's, it's this idea that what was expressed in Zen philosophy is a, a reflection of um, what, what has been developed through quantum physics in Western science. So all of this to say that the decentering here happens by precisely trying to make all the human beings in this novel, starting with Ruth, aware of how small they are in time, in space, um, and how what matters is not their role so much as their connection to the rest of the world. Um, the way that they influence and the way they are influenced um, by other things. So a story that starts off as a classic mise en abyme where the narrator finds a diary and other objects on the beach and this results into um, two interlocked stories. Soon, that story soon finds itself superseded by the experience of non-linear temporalities. Uh, the narrator finds herself following animal guides into the past to change the course of events that she is reading about. She starts studying quantum theories of the multiverse, which I have not talked about but this whole thing where basically Oliver teaches her about, you know, I, do, I decide to do this. So at the moment that I take my decision, um, the, the whole world splits into two different worlds one where I took decision A and then the other way I took decision B, for example. So branching out into um, multiverses. Um, and then just Ruth starts inhabiting time differently as the island where she lives off you know, the British Columbian coast imposes a different temporal regime outside of the policed capitalistic frame and closer to that of the deep non-human time. Uh, something that her husband so uh, is trying to uh, recreate uh, through a prehistoric forest. And so through the circuitous temporalities that run parallel, that overlap, that intersect or otherwise diverge through the novel, the narratives disrupt linear geological time um, and representation of a time that use the human as a measurement standard. The novel establishes new modes of relationality both within human communities and between humans and the non-human world uh, so that we may imagine ourselves as part of the world rather than outside and above it. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Eloise, um, um, for, again, I think um, uh, a talk that um, rounds up very well what we um, started, off, started off on um, uh, today and um, also rounds up very well the, the entire uh, the entire three days. Um, okay, um, I think there's a lot to talk about. Um, shall I? Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna let the floor sort of um, uh, start with questions if you'd like. Um, otherwise, I, I have questions. So I'll just, um, yeah, I'll shut up for a little bit and see, see if there's a question that pops up. So um, just if you want to ask a question, activate your mic or raise your hand or um, and just um, ask it. Well, I, I actually have a question. Uh, thank you to the three of you first for your wonderful papers. It was really interesting. And I have a question for Will and Emily, um, for both of you, actually. I was just um, thinking of um, the definition of onto stories Emily gave us, uh, Jane Burnett's definition of it, onto stories. And I was wondering whether we had lots of those stories, maybe in Shakespeare's time or before, and then we sort of like lost them or forgotten them or I was thinking fables and everything. And if, well, if you can think of lots of them, there were lots of them in the past and maybe we, we have few of them now, or whether she means something else by onto stories and I'm, I don't quite get it. So that, that part is more for Emily and so, well, so I don't know which one of uh, you two wants to answer first, but um, I was curious about that. Oh, uh, I think you've got to turn your mic on. No, that, thanks. That, thanks. It. Yeah. So, um, if I kind of understood sort of onto stories as kind of stories of, sort of non-human agencies, is that kind of? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting some sort of re reassuring nods. So, so that's that's um, that's good to see. So, um, I suppose um, you know, with, with all with these these questions, you kind of have to sort of. Um, uh, kind of uh, think of the, the the thing that springs to mind most immediately I suppose um, and the thing that you know that does spring to mind most immediately is um, 
is of its metamorphoses. Um, basically, um, and um, the way in which kind of Shakespeare kind of um, absorbs um, and kind of um, sort of, uh, yeah, sort of ab ab absorbs and sort of, you know, digests sort of uh, uh, of his metamorphoses in things like, you know, Summer Night's Dream and everything, because there are plenty of stories where, um, you know, animals quite literally sort of take human beings sort of over um, and not not only are these kinds of these sort of um, animals sort of taking human beings over in various ways and in contexts of female violence you know, quite quite specifically um, and I think Emily was talking about Pygmalion and um, and you know there's the image of Medusa in the, in the stone in the stone woman and everything um, but I suppose what's interesting about you know of its metamorphoses is the fact that it's also um, not only constituent stories, but they themselves metamorphose into each other kind of over historical time. And it kind of, it, it quite clearly sort of sells itself as a universal history of the metamorphoses with kind of, you know, um, chaos at the very beginning and leading all the way up to the time of writing um, via things like you know metempsychosis in, in book 15 and things so um i suppose yeah um maybe i mean i'd be interested in sort of emily's kind of you know response to this as maybe we could see um every of his metamorphoses as a kind of prototype for the for the for the onto story or the constituent stories within the metamorphoses as a kind of proto onto story mm. Yes, I think considering the, you know, the fascination for Ovid, it's, it, it, he's been, he's being rewritten quite a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, so I guess Ovid, yeah, would be probably a good example. What she means, Bennett, I think, um, uh, she means to stories that emphasize, well, the, the difference with stories from the past, like of it, I guess, would be that she's looking for narratives that would really go for a sense of equality uh, between the different creatures. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is why she advocates for anthropomorphism but a non-anthropocentric anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. She says it's fine, you know, because, you know, anthropomorphism allows you to actually connect, you know, on, on some sort of, you know, uh, equal foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, it should not be an anthropocentric anthropomorphism. Actually, that, that's a lot of anthropo thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but meaning that it should it should not be you know like the kind of anthropomorphism that you, you you can find in for instance the classic fables with animals where in fact the animals are here as metaphors or you know as embodying moral lessons etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's yeah what she means by those narratives is narrative that that would decenter mm. anthropomorphism but use it nevertheless in order to have those kinds of connections of you know re you know so recreating the uh the, our relationship to the non-human world mm -hmm. on on some sort of equal footing mm. thank you very much is, is this a recent um did you write this recently or is it quite an old was it in vibrant matters or is it a much it's more... with vibrant matter yeah okay so she she made that call quite a few years ago yeah, the new stories. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sorry, Will. I think I interrupted you, or was it? No, no, no. That's. Um, I mean, I, I kind of passed over to to, to Emily. Okay. So yeah, that's that. That was fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I guess I had a question um, for Eloise, and you know, by extension, um, to, to to everybody really, because I think it sort of touches on some interesting questions of of, of temporality. Um, I mean, I was, I was, I was interested in um, <clears throat> this idea of, um, you know, Zen Buddhism and the, the idea that, that everything is connected 
um, and and this idea of, of, of temporality. Um, and um, I was working with um, um, a, a Buddhist on a on a book to do with you know spirits and Shakespeare's, and um, we kind of got thinking about the idea of you know concentration and the centre in concentration and the fact that you've got multiple centres, you know, as the, the word concentration um, suggests, um, happening, you know, in a sort of relatively um, kind of uh, everyday sense when, you, when you're meditating. But I, I was wondering if, you know, concentration is, is some, something we might see as a kind of like a guiding concept of, of the fictions of, of Ruth Zeki. Um, absolutely. Um, I think I'll have to check, but I think like the word concentric, like the adjective concentric, um, is recurring throughout the novel to describe precisely that it's, it's concentric, it's rhizomatic, it's just, you know, it, it does so many things. Um, what it does not do is, you know, your, you know, classic linear kind of, um, you know, um, river-like flow of time. It, it just branches out. Um, and so this idea, and it, especially for the meditation, I think I'll have to find it. I don't um, remember exactly where it is, but there is this description of meditation uh, when Jiko is trying to teach now to meditate. Um, and what's also, I didn't you know, talk about it, but um, so the, the, the teenager is named Naoko and she often shortens her name to now, which sounds like now, like the, the word now, the present time in English, obviously, and this is not a coincidence. Um, there is a sense of, you know, recentering in the now, but also, and, and experiencing the past, the future as concentric circles around you rather than, you know, something behind you, something in front of you, and you're moving away from the, uh, from the one and toward the other inexorably, uh, but rather something that exists all around you um, and that you can reach out into um, in various ways. So I think there's definitely this idea of, um, you know, secularity um, and then finding this idea of, decentering and recentering and finding a, a way to recenter in a way that does not exclude um, so much of what is excluded in our usual ways of centering ourselves. When we center ourselves, um, you know, the capitalistic framework, the colonial framework, uh, I mean, I would go back to Sylvia Winter, obviously, for this, but all these frameworks force us, force us to, re, to center ourselves in a way that excludes everything else around us, you know, whether it is the plants, the animals, uh, that in, forces us to recenter in a way that also excludes us from thinking about the consequences of our actions and of uh, our recentering in this way. And Ozeki is, um, I think, try, in the novel, she is trying to find a way to recenter herself, to decenter that process and recenter herself in a way that has her fully existing within this connection, within this network, um, and seeing, you know, others around her as also their own, you know, little concentric centers of meditation, if that makes sense. I have a question for the two of you, and, and, and that, that, that ties in with what you just said about this uh, concentric circles. I love this expression of the time beings. I think it's so nice, you know, that, uh, how, and, and I guess this ties in with a notion of time as uh, through quantum physics as something like iterations. Mm -hmm. And so the present as some sort of uh, potential uh, containing potentially iterations of both the past and the future. And so, I was wondering, Eloise, if you could talk maybe a little bit more about those time beings and, and maybe William with the spirits of Shakespeare, <laughs> would they, could we consider them as time beings? Uh, how would that work? Yeah, that is, that is a lovely question. I do remember that like when I started reading, I mean, the, the novel literally begins with um, a quote by, you know, the masters, then master Dogen Zenji, Called for the time being, um, it is it is an actual poem, um, and it goes like this: For the time being, standing on the tallest mountain top; for the time being, moving on the deepest ocean floor; for the time being, a demon with three heads um, and eight arms; for the time being, the golden sixteen-foot body of a Buddha; 
and all, it goes on like this until for the time being the entire earth and the boundless sky. It's a beautiful poem. And I, I really do think that her way of, you know, talking about it in this way, especially starting with now, um, now is, you know, her diary is the very first chapter and she opens by saying, hi, my name is now and I'm a time being. Um, and well, first of all, I mean, it's cute, right? Especially she writes in like a Hello Kitty lunchbox. Um, she writes her diary with like purple gel pen. Um, and precisely because she knows that that way she will kind of go undetected um, because people don't care, right? About like a teenage girl writing her thoughts and, you know, like really um, all her thoughts about philosophy. People don't care about that. Um, so in a way, that's a way for her to kind of explore what being a time being means for her um, with that, the responsibility of, you know, saying very serious and intelligent sounding stuff to impress other people. She can just be herself. So th this idea of like time being, and I love your idea of like, the, and I think that's also echoed in the novel. Um, the present is um, this kind of, at the same time, there exists only the present and there is no present, if that makes sense. There is, the present exists as, again, yes, this potential, uh, this moment of utter potential um, where everything that has ever existed can exist and everything that may ever exist also does exist. And then the same thing it does, um, so it exists as potential. It ex there is only the present because everything in the past and in the future is already contained in the present, but that also means that there is no present. So time in that sense, um, the time being is not just the person or the being who lives in time, but also the being that understands that they're not moving through time and for, like forward into time, they are moving with time. And um, it, again, you know, it's rhizomatic, it's, you know, um, concentric and this idea of like iteration of the past and the future into the present is what allows um, Ruth to make the, the you know, to bridge Zen philosophy and quantum physics. And I think that it's at that moment in the level where she just, her dreams, start propelling her further into now's narrative and start further entangling her into the narrative of the, the, the young teenager. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, I, I was using the word iteration in reference to the work of Karen Bard on quantum mm -hmm. physics. So, you know, I, I don't know if, if you're familiar with her work and how she uses Derrida's notion of quantum physics, uh, uh, there is a notion of iteration, sorry, <laughs> in relation to quantum physics to explore this sort of, it's difficult, this difficult, you know, kind of uh, notion of time that you can't really wrap your head around of, you know, the cat being in the box while not being in the box and being dead, but not dead, etc., etc. So. <laughs> I've heard her name. I'm not familiar with her work. I haven't read her work, um, but I, I've been meaning to to do so precisely because I'm at the point in my dissertation where I'm trying to write the paragraph, the whole section about quantum physics. Um, oh, yeah, and, read Karen Barr. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, space time warping, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can't. Space time mattering. She calls that space time mattering. It's very space interesting. Matter. Okay. All right. So um, thank you for the reference. I can't really talk about, you know, in relation to her work um, right now, but it sounds like a fantastic reference. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, it'll be super useful. <laughs> just, just picking up on, on Emily's question and, and Eloise and, and um, what you're saying about the now, I mean, um, I couldn't help thinking about which is the third, you know, and where, you know, the very place starts with the word now, now is the winter of our discontentment, mm -hmm. Lois and Wilson, who are the clouds that on this house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it's almost as if, like, um, you know, Richard the third is saying, drop what you do, you know, drop everything. You, you're talking, you're listening to me now, right? You know, now is it? And um, then he sort of goes on to say, you know, but I, who am not shaped for these sportive tricks, so he's contrasting himself with the now that he's just sort of, sort of enunciated. Um, and then one thing that's interesting about Richard III is he kind of constantly swears by St Paul, and uh, that's a very rare oath in, 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 in Shakespeare, and he only swears by St Paul, and, um, and St Paul is, is the great sort of convertee, 
par excellence, you know, and he's kind of like, you know, he's, he's transforming himself into this kind of messianic time, but in a kind of very demonic way. It's kind of sort of an anti Paul. And at the end of that play, I mean, he's beset by ghosts, you know, he's beset by spirits, these kinds of, you know, these spirits who are trying to sort of like, get, you know, sort of take, take this kind of like revenge of temporality on this, on this upstart who's tried to kind of gone through an anti-Paul, anti-Messianic kind of sort of time frame. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, you know, to, to take that sort of Deridian idea, whether it's, you know, sort of, I've not really thought about Richard III in this way before, but it, whether it's some kind of like sort of ghastly sort of demonic parody of the sort of Deridian sort of avenir, you know, where it's kind of, you know, in, instead of this kind of messianic time sort of like magnetizing us through the present and kind of um, confounding our ideas of time, whether um, it's a little bit like, you know, Dr. Faust where, you know, worldly time kind of gets its revenge. Um, but at the same time, you know, kind of sort of, um, sort of, well, conflicted sympathies for Richard III because he's single-handedly taken us through this story and we, we are kind of somehow sort of empathizing with him in, in, in a way whether you know it's a kind of a, a sort of a, a messianic sort of time through the back door so to speak and the sort of like the the direct the, the sort of the, the fact that we, we actually quite like Richard III despite ourselves um, actually kind of um, has a kind of a, a silent sympathy for this kind of um, a little bit like made it Lady Macbeth actually the future in the instant you know the fact that what we are, what we find exciting about Richard the third and 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 um, Lady Macbeth is the fact that they kind of they pull us through the present you know um, and they pull us through the present with every theatrical iteration of what they do yeah and um, I had a question if yes my mic is on um um and I guess that's a it's a question for all three of you um I uh, one of the things that sort of um 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 yeah sort of popped up in my mind um um through uh, you know all of your presentations um was this idea of I mean I was struck first by um uh, what you said Will about presentism and that whole notion and the, the kind of opposition between you know historicism and presentism and then I felt that you know this notion of the present the, and the present moment and the moment of being that sort of kept cropping up um, and I was wondering um, about this kind of I guess this um, um, this opposition maybe between you know, on the one hand, you've got the present and then deep time that are both, you know, sort of ways of being in time that seem quite inc incompatible with kind of human life as we know it, you know, the, the busyness, uh, the busyness, the drama, as you were saying, uh, um, Eloise, of, of human life. And I was interested in that kind of the opposition between those ways of thinking time and then, and of being in time, and then history, you know, um, which is human time by excellence, you know, it's, it's written, it's narrated, it's, it's, it's dramatic, and so on and so forth. And I was wondering how that kind of, how those attempts at kind of um, um, pulling away from history and, and drama and so on, how that was compatible, um, or how that worked with um, a, well, drama, you know, the theatre, and, and you, you were just mentioning a, a history play. So, you know, how, how that kind of way of working against history or sort of trying to disentangle ourselves from history, how that might work um, with, with drama and, and the theater on the one hand, and how that might work with um, this kind of awareness of politics that you were mentioning, um, um, Emily, and that I think also is part of um, that kind of gender politics of, you know, the young girl writing, um, um, as you were saying, um, Eloise. Sorry, did that make any sense at all? Stop, it might not stop. have. <laughs> William? Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll sort of um, dive, dive into the breach. Um, I guess there's, yeah, there, there, there are sort of various ways in which kind of, um, you know, sort of Shakespeare kind of um, sort of deconstructs history or sort of seems to have, have, have sort of certain issues with the, the sort of the, 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 the hist historical times of sequence, um, just in the way he kind of um, 
sort of rearranges, uh, he kind of doesn't write his historical plays in the order of history and he kind of selects them rather according to sort of like moments of kind of vivid sort of uh, dramatic sort of potential. Um, and I guess um, one thing that we might think about sort of theatrical and historical time um, I mean, I suppose you've got questions of sort of like historical parallels as well, but there's also the kind of the, the, uh, the existentialist sort of the unavoidable existentialism of, of, of actually sort of getting on stage and, and, and saying this stuff and, and sort of um, saying this stuff with a kind of a mixture of, sort of you know, um, um, pause and um, articulation. Um, <clears throat> and so every sort of iteration is, is different. Um, and perhaps there's a silent calling whenever you're kind of watching a Shakespeare history play to kind of sort of bracket historical time um, and kind of <clears throat> see um, these kind of flat up raised spirits as <clears throat> uh, kind of sort of plunging you backwards um, into that historical moment um, and sharing in that kind of as if it was as if it were for the first time um, maybe that's a sort of um, why maybe the chorus in Henry V a very sort of meta theatrical device I mean it's not straight history at all it, he's constantly reminding you of the disparity of, of theatrical representation and one of those disparities is crunching and concertinaing historical time to make it fit theatrical time um, and you know this idea of the wooden O is, is is almost like kind of like a skull as well that you know the distracted globe that the globe theatre is a kind of communal sort of historical space for remembering um, but bringing that you know that that sort of, that, that past back to sort of vivid um, kind of physical life. Um, this is a you know I mean it's you know, it's a very messy answer, um, but it's you know just sort of scattered sort of responses to this kind of dialectic of, of historicism and presentism. But um, you know that's more of a kind of a uh, as I say a bit of an impressionist sketch pad I suppose. I, I apologise. No, thank you. <laughs> Well, if I understood your question correctly, and then, I, but I think Eloise will have maybe more to say than me on this question because my the, the stories that I, I I discussed here, there's not this question of history, not so much, but but as you said, this paradox of being in the present at the same time as considering other time frames, especially very vast time frames like a, a geological time frame, so. I guess my answer to this would be what I'm interested in is the um, the tools that the writers are going to use uh, to to transcribe these paradoxes. And like I said, there's, there's very much the use of the oxymoron, which obviously is precisely you know bringing together two opposite notions. Um, or, or yeah, yeah like especially in a stone woman, it's very, very uh, uh, striking that, you know, she's at the same time very solid. And at the same time, suddenly she finds herself very, uh, in, she has this desire to move, okay, while becoming stone. So that, that would be the oxymoron. And as I said, the analogy, rather than the metaphor, because the metaphor, with the metaphor, there's, there's this notion that you separate two things. You know, one of them disappears in the metaphor, whereas with the uh, with the metonymy or with the analogy, you you kind of create this web that we've been talking about, and so that would be my answer to this question of how do you reconcile uh, being a body a uh, yeah a body in the present? Uh, I would insist again on being a body and. Uh, considering other uh, more vast time frames, but maybe Eloise in, in the novel, in the novel, it seems to be much more an interrogation than in my sh you know, short story. There, I, I just, I just meant in the sense that um, because you work on on stories by women and about women and about sort of that sort of gender equality. Um, um, that, that issue of gender equality or, or the violence against women and so on. I just felt these are the kinds of, um, I mean, they're not issues that can be qualified as drama, but they're definitely part of the, you know, the drama of human beings 
um, 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 living together, which I would identify as history um, more than, you know, those kind of uh, moments of being, right? Um, so I was wondering whether how um, the, the focus on those teeny tiny, you know, moments, I'm thinking of the, the, the beholder, you know, thinking of the, the moment of blossoming and so on, how that was, um, how and whether that was particularly compatible with the, the sort of political, you know, um, um, activism, you know, through writing that you could, that can be found in those stories, you know, the fact that they're stories also about focusing on women and, and, and their becoming, uh, if that makes sense. Eloise? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, um, picking up on what uh, Emily has been saying, um, clearly, I mean, in the novel, in Ozeki's novel, so it's, there's two things. In Ozeki's novel, history is, historical time is like one strand, one possible strand of all different types of temporalities. Um, and it's not, it's not, what I really like about the novel is that it isn't, try to abolish historical time. It doesn't, you know, try to tell us, okay, it's, you know, it's human time. History is human time, it's bad. Um, because historical time is also, for example, what allows now to reconnect to her family heritage, um, to understand that she, you know, her um, father's uncle was a kamikaze, a pacifist kamikaze, who decided to never talk about his pacifist beliefs in order for his mother, so Jiko, to receive the pension that kamikaze pilots who had, you know, um, who had not survived their mission, um, that the families of those pilots received. Um, so he basically, um, you know, try, he defied history in his own quiet way. For example, he would write to his mother in French so that um, his letters would not be censored. Um, he was a poet, he was a philosopher, he was in love with beauty. Um, all these kinds of things that really, really, um, um, yeah, place him in, in a certain history. Um, Ruth is, um, in the novel, Ruth is obviously part Japanese and she reconnects with her own familial history by trying to decipher the kanjis in the letters um, from um, Nao's uh, great uncle. Um, and also just now, like she learns that, um, so her mother is again, this badass, uh, great grandmother is this badass anarchist nun. Uh, and she learns to honor the legacy of her great grandmother, especially as she understands that she named her, um, her daughters one is named after Emma Goldman um, because she loved Emma Goldman so much. And then the other is named after a Japanese anarchist um, who was also um, killed for her beliefs. So there is, it allows now to kind of like, to know that history, it allows her to reconnect with that heritage. And that's really important to her development as a young teenage girl. Um, so there's also that feminist aspect that, that plays into that. The second thing, um, I think that your question um, actually works also really well for another book of my um, PhD corpus, which might actually be a, 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 of interest to William. It's called Station Eleven by uh, Emily St. John Mendel. Um, I don't know if you if uh, you know it, William, but it's basically, it's by this Canadian author um, and it's this world, and it's kind of eerie reading that novel during this COVID pandemic, but um, basically, um, this, you know, one snowy night, winter night in Toronto, um, a virus, Georgia flu, arrives on the North American continent and just wipes out, in, in the entire world, it wipes out like three quarters of humanity. Um, and the novel is set both, you know, 20 years after the pandemic, this pandemic, and also it covers um, up until that night, that fateful night, it covers the life of Arthur Leander, who's an actor and who plays Shakespeare, um, and he dies that fateful night, not of the virus, but of a heart attack while playing King Lear in a kind of like special production. And the novel, I mean, the novel opens on that production and opens with the king stood in a pool of blue light unmoored. This was act four of King Lear, Winter Night at the Elgin Theater in Toronto. And it's a beautiful um, depiction of that representation. Um, and one of the little girls, so there are three, the, the We'll say the, the 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 characteristic of that representation is that there are three little girls on stage at some point, and one of these little girls, Kirsten Raymond, survived the pandemic and grows up um, twenty years after that fateful night. Um, she follows the symphony, the traveling symphony, um, which is basically a troupe of musicians and actors 
who travel uh, all around the Great Lakes area um, in Canada and the United States, now that borders actually matter then. Um, and they, you know, um, they play music uh, and they put on um, Shakespeare uh, plays for the settlements that they meet. Um, and one of the most, um, so there's King Lear that's referenced, there's Miranda uh, and the Tempest, they're all kind of references to, to the Tempest. There is also, um, at some point, there's a part, um, I mean, there's a references to Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and what I find really interesting is that the novel combines, so that's why I was, I was thinking it might be more appropriate to that book to your question, because you were talking about, you know, staging and drama. And there is, in the, the, the world after the pandemic and the collapse, um, people, it's this idea of like, what is there in terms of culture? What, you know, and the plays that they're putting on, the plays that they're acting out. Um, the, there is um, this guy, Francois Diallo, in the, the 20 years after the pandemic, who's trying to write a history of the world before. Um, and he talks to Kirsten about it. And so there is this idea, this sense of trying to resurrect a sense of history in this new world that kind of has abolished um, any sense of history because you know the internet and Shakespeare are relegated to the same time frame. It was before the pandemic, and now the his like the internet is as obsolete as Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and perhaps even more so um, than Shakespeare. Um, so I think it might um, obviously you know we we don't have time to talk about this in, in in great depth, but I think that like this novel really takes up that idea. It has its drawbacks, it has its flaws, but mm -hmm. it really takes up the idea of like what do we do? Um, how do we connect historical time? Uh, a kind of like grander planetary time, non-human time, um, and how like how does that filter? How is that filtered through drama? How is that filtered through the the whole idea of representation in theater? So yeah, it's an extension on that kind of vexed question as, as to the relation between you know, Shakespeare and folk folk memory. You know, mm -hmm. like um, um, you know, it's, it's kind of um, it's like, you know, like, does he invent the human, as you know, Harold Bloom says, and is he a kind of sign of humanity for us to take past catastrophe? Mm -hmm. um, and does he become a, you know, a, a sign for collective folk memory? And if so, can he be kind of dangerously reappropriated, as had, has, has happened over history? But I quite like there's a slightly more sort of optimistic opening out into the future. Wow. Um... Thank you. Um, I think so. It's we're actually past um, our time, and uh, we would want to, to sort of um, impinge. Impin I think you know this working from home has had us, you know, um, um, have meetings during lunch breaks and things like that. So I think we, we should try and sort of stick okay. as much as we can. <laughs> um, With, um, Zoom backdrop, but it, you know maybe didn't quite work. But yeah. So <laughs> So, um, so thank you so much um, for, you know, um, for your papers, for, you know, your, your uh, um, um, uh, participation today for this, this discussion. Um, uh, I think we, we all had a great time. Um, I will, okay, um, two things, three things. Um, there's, uh, I think um, um, some of you saw, um, there's a comment by um, Saha um, in the chat box that she just um, chose to, you know, leave there um, um, as we were running out of time. Um, so that's on um, hyperobjects, um, um, Tim Timothy Morton's uh, notion of hyperobjects, um, uh, in case that might be um, useful to, to some of you. Um, also, we are um, in the process of preparing, uh, Sarah actually is in the process of uh, preparing the, the third leg of our project on um, uh, material studies and politics. Um, so, which I think will be, you know, this panel because of the whole, um, you know, multiple connections with other types of beings, uh, other types of things uh, and materials, I think uh, will be a very, very nice transition. Um, so we're working on that. We will post about this um, on our website. Um, we will probably pester you a little bit um, with it so that you, you um, just in case you find it interesting to sort of um, see how those those different um, um, things tie in together. Um, 
So we'll do that. The videos will be online. Um, you also probably um, uh, get an email from us um, when that's done. And um, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much again. Um, well, thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and see you around. See you. Thank hopefully, you. Hopefully, hopefully for real. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. Very much. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Okay, bye. bye. Take care. Bye.